Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, England's secret weapon, the two million ton mega carrier made of ice. Just before we get started, I do want to say that this video is brought to you, rather appropriately, by World of Warships. It's the thinking man's action game. And stay tuned because I am going to give this game a try in this video. But if you do want to get started now, make sure you check out the link to the game in the description below. Loads of free perks for the first 300 viewers who go and check out this free game. And going through that link, of course, helps support the show. So we appreciate it. And let's get started. During World War II, Britain was taking a beating from the German ships and submarines and was looking for something to build a ship out of that couldn't be destroyed by torpedoes, or at least could take a major pounding without incurring a fatal amount of damage. With steel and aluminium in short supply, Allied scientists and engineers were encouraged to come up with alternative materials and weapons. So enter a remarkable scientist named Geoffrey Pike, who we could call the king of alternative ideas. You're actually going to learn more about this in the bonus fact section in a bit. Most pertinent to the topic at hand was his idea to build a 2,000 foot, that's 600 meters long, 300 foot, that's 90 meters wide, and 2 million ton in weight carrier. For reference here, a typical supercarrier, the largest battleship ever built, rings in at about 100,000 tons, give or take. Pike named his project Habakkuk, a biblical reference that seems to mirror the project's goal. Be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 5. Unlike in the Bible, though, the ship's name was spelled with two Bs and one K, which is thought to be simply a spelling error that was repeated so many times that it actually became official. Besides this ship's giant size, what was so different about Pike's vessel was that it would be made of ice. There is no real limit on the availability of ice. It's easy to make, fairly durable, except in warm temperatures, buoyant, and very easy to repair when damaged. Further, repairs can be made extremely quickly with the right equipment, even during a battle. The ship was also to include 40 dual-barreled gun turrets, as well as other anti-aircraft guns, and an airstrip that could accommodate up to 150 fighter planes or twin-engined bombers. Pike was able to sell Winston Churchill on his plan in 1942, including Churchill stating it should be given the highest priority. In testing, though, it was discovered that ice might not be as strong as the icebergs that Pike modeled his idea on. It turned out that ice frozen into blocks for the hull could be broken very easily with something as small as a hammer. The project was temporarily abandoned as a result of this. However, later that year, a New York polytechnic firm added cellulose, sawdust, wood chips, and paper shreds to water and froze it. This was going to be a much more promising base structure for the ship. Not only was it stronger than straight frozen water, with as little as 4% of wood pulp added, it would become as hard as concrete. Pound for pound, it was also much slower to melt and much more buoyant. Pikerite, named after Jeffrey Pike, could also be cut like wood and easily milled into shapes. There was one problem, though. Melting and refreezing would cause warping in the structure. Tests showed that a pikerite ship would eventually sag unless constantly cooled to around 3 degrees Fahrenheit, that's minus 16 degrees Celsius. To maintain this, the ship's surface would need to be covered in insulation, and it would need a refrigeration plant and a duct system. To test the feasibility of getting around this problem, a small-scale version of the ship was constructed in Alberta, Canada's Lake Patricia to experiment with insulation and refrigeration possibilities and to see how it would stand up to artillery shelling. The test ship was to be 30 feet wide by 60 feet long, 9 by 18 meters, and weighed 1,000 tons, and was kept refrigerated by a one-horsepower engine, which was sufficient to keep it from melting even through the hot summer months. In ballistic testing, it was determined that a direct torpedo hit would only cause about a 10-foot crater in the hull which was insignificant given the size of the proposed ship. Thus, it would be nearly impervious to torpedo attacks for all practical purposes, as it would take a huge number of torpedoes and other bombs to sink the ship. So even if the ship was broken up, the Axis powers would have to invest a massive amount of their resources in the given area to do it. This would have weakened them significantly on other fronts during the attack. If they were unsuccessful, the ship could be easily and quickly repaired right on the spot. So overall, the test ship, it made it look like the full-size version would totally work out. At this point, it was estimated that construction on the real Habakkuk would cost $2.5 million, which is about $32 million today, which is actually a total bargain given the ship would be so big. 
However, there were still some hurdles that needed to be overcome. The rudder on such a ship would have to be absolutely massive, and how to effectively mount this in the structure in a way that would be resistant to attack was a big problem, as was controlling such a rudder. Further, the amount of wood pulp needed would have massively impacted paper production. Also, while the ship used significantly less steel than most, the steel tubing it did need for reinforcing the structure would have depleted reserves for conventional proven warships. In addition to all of that, a huge amount of cork would be required to insulate the ship, and finally the ship's top speed of just 6 to 7 knots, that's 6.9 to 8.1 miles per hour or 11 to 13 kilometers an hour, was deemed too slow, even with it being fairly torpedo-proof in terms of the main structure itself. In the end, these problems, combined with the fact that during the planning phase, the range of aircraft had increased significantly to the point where the need for a floating island became less necessary, ultimately sunk the plan. It should be noted, however, that while the plan to build this ship was short lived, its prototype was surprisingly resilient. It took three hot summers to completely melt the smaller version of the boat. Before we get into Pike and his crazy ideas that never planned out, we'd like to take a brief moment to discuss one of his ideas that actually worked, his idea on how to escape from a German prison camp. The reason he had to come up with this idea was because he found himself in a German prison camp. Most of his fellow prisoners thought he was crazy even then, as even if he was able to get out of the camp, it was felt that he would either starve, be caught or killed before getting out of Germany itself. He proved them all wrong, becoming the first person to successfully escape from the camp that he was in. In his normal fashion, he meticulously studied all available accounts of escape attempts to date by others and why and where they failed. He then devised a plan, at which point he and Edward Falk, a fellow inmate, began a rigorous exercise routine to prepare for their journey. His plan went as such. First, use the fact that there was an athletic equipment shed that, while regularly checked by soldiers, was checked at a time of day when, if the sun was out and it was the right time of year, the sun's rays would glare off a window and cause the soldiers looking into the darkened shed not to be able to see properly. Thus, even though he and Falk could see the guard and weren't well hidden, the guard could not see them in the small shack. Once the time of year came, Pike and Fork thusly successfully managed to hide in mostly plain sight in the shed. After hiding out until nightfall, they then managed to slip out of the camp with the supply of food they'd been rationing. Following a truly harrowing journey, they made it to what they thought was the border and were caught. Turns out, though, that they were actually in the Netherlands when caught and were not caught by a German soldier as they had initially thought, but a Dutch one. They totally made it. So we have some more crazy ideas to follow, but just before we get into those, just let me tell you that this video is brought to you by World of Warships. Now, they might not have a supercarrier made of ice in this game, but the game does put you in command of a massive fleet featuring some of history's most iconic warships. Now, as you might know if you've been watching this channel for a while, I do like to try out the things that sponsor this channel, and uh, this is certainly one that was entertaining. It's, an, it's a game, so I just loaded it onto my computer and well, YouTube is pretty famous for people gaming, so I gave that a go. Let's uh, let's switch to my computer. All right, here we are. Today I found our gaming channel. This is World of Warships. Thanks to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. This boat I'm looking at right now is awesome. Look at the detail on this thing. You can zoom in. It looks awesome. You can go all around. We're going to play a game in a second. Just do bear in mind I'm a very casual gamer. Uh, this is the first time I'm recording a game, actually, so this is a whole new experience. I play sometimes with friends online. This is the Gamble Town, which is a British boat, apparently, or maybe it's just realized I'm British. Who knows? But this is one you can get for free if you follow the link in the description below. This is a free game, but obviously with a game, you know, there's lots of stuff you can buy if you want to. I haven't paid for anything, and I'm still having a good time. So let's just get into a battle, shall we? While this loads, while it finds someone for me to play with, I will say that there's four different classes of ships, but there's 200 total ships that you can play with. Here we go. Here we go. So this is a good place to poke around. So we are in some place with islands. You can like zoom in and out with a scroll wheel. We can take a look at our beautiful vessel, the Campbelltown. If we hit map, we can see where we are. The idea is we're going to capture this enemy base or destroy all of the dudes. The bad dudes, there's a bunch of them. I think if we hit tab, we can see who they are. Yeah, so there's me. And then there's all these other dudes like Mike and Beast and the Professor. I have no idea who these guys are, but we're playing with them. Here are my friends. If we just go full steam ahead, or full diesel ahead, or full nuclear ahead, whatever, I'm guessing diesel, whatever this guy runs on. So these are my team. We got like, what is that? 16 players in this one game, but apparently there are 7 million players who play this thing. So there's always people to play with. I actually got my ass whipped pretty badly, uh, pretty badly last time. These things are devastating. These little underwater missiles. 
It's not a good time. Yeah, direct hit! Wow, this is actually going surprisingly well. Oh, oh! Um, that has never happened before. Some guy just shot a super weapon at me or something and just sank me in one go. That was, that was pretty devastating. I think I was playing with the Black Swan before, which... It's kind of a little more of a baby ship. Uh, definitely easier to handle. I think I'd probably be more suited just piloting one of these lifeboats, to be honest. I'm uh, not the best. Oh, look, we're on the ship. The detail on this is great. They were saying, they were telling me that uh, it takes like six months to make each individual ship. Hang on, there's a bad guy. There's a bad guy. Please hit, please hit. Boom! Oh, oh no, come on. What chance have you got, American? Oh, my ship is screwed. Someone has been... This is the problem if you spend too much... Oh! oh no! If you spend too much time in the, uh, with the scope thing, then you, you don't notice how badly you're getting screwed up. Off we go. Giant ships, not exactly known for their talk. This time, less time on the scope. Does that guy have a... Uh, dazzle camouflage? I think we made a video about that. It's like where you have the ships painted all crazy colours so they're harder to aim missiles at. There's just one guy left. Oh, uh, and it's bad times for him. He's... Yes, that's what we're talking about. Alright guys, that's World of Warships. I just wanted at least one victory to show you success. It's a lot of fun, as you can probably see. Alright, let's, let's cut back to the studio. So that was fun. Got my butt kicked a couple of times, but it's a fun game. And now let's get into those other crazy ideas. Besides the ice ship, Pike once suggested using thousands of balloons with microphones and transmitters attached as a way of triangulating enemy positions. He was not aware at the time of the achievements and development in radar technology. And now for another bonus fact. Yet another oddball invention Pike came up with to help in the war was a screw-propelled snow vehicle. The vehicle would be propelled by having two cylinders with flanges in a screw-thread-like fashion spinning in opposite directions and varying their speed to facilitate turns. The M29 Weasel put an end to the production of Pike's snow vehicle and it never saw the light of day. And now for another bonus fact. Yet another idea of Pike's was to use Pikerites to quickly construct buildings and protective barriers in a mobile war. In the end, this was deemed impractical given the amount of equipment, water, and pulp that would need to be lugged around. And now for another bonus fact. Another idea of Pike's, this one to solve the problem of transporting equipment from ships to shore in the many places where a harbor wasn't available, was to create massive pipe systems from the ships that would be extended to shore and beyond as the soldiers advanced. These were literal supply lines. Equipment could be packed in air containers that would be whisked through the pipes to the waiting soldiers. Ultimately, a more practical idea was developed using floating trucks and floating concrete structures. A similar idea was to extend the piping system to quickly transport not only equipment but soldiers too, particularly over difficult to cross terrain. Soldiers would be given oxygen masks and propelled through the pipes via water flowing through. In order to get around the inevitable problem of soldiers panicking while they were whisked through these pipes they couldn't get out of until they reached the end, he recommended drugging them first if they felt they'd have a problem with it. As he said, the whole experience of riding in a pipe, however, should be far less unpleasant and take very much less time to become used to than parachute jumping or being bombed. And now for another bonus fact. Another of Pike's impractically genius ideas, this time after the war, was to get around the energy crisis by having trains not be propelled by conventional fuels but by human power. His idea was to equip each train car with dozens of bicycle-like contraptions. Passengers would then be expected to pedal. This would cause people to eat more, needing more calories, which was a problem given post-war food shortages. Pike felt this was fine because while certain foods were in short supply, sugar was plentiful and a pound of sugar converted to energy via the human digestive system would produce more energy than from burning a pound of coal or oil, which there was a shortage of. So, yes, if you haven't picked up on it yet, in essence, Pike was a real-life Flint Lockwood. And now for another bonus fact. Despite only a few of his ideas having some merit to them, with most being amazingly impractical, Pike was kept around for a time simply because the chief of combined operations, Lewis Mountbatten, felt that Pike's steady stream of outlandish ideas was good for the other members of his staff to hear to try to get them to think a bit more outside of the box. Unfortunately, the eccentric Pike ultimately committed suicide in 1948 by ingesting an entire bottle of sleeping pills and leaving a note saying that it was intentional. So once again, just let me quickly thank World of Warships for sponsoring this video. The first 300 players to use the code PLAYWARSHIPS2018 can get 250 doubloons, 1 million credits, the HMS Campbelltown with a premium ship which I was getting my butt kicked in, and one port slot and three days of premium time when you click the link in the description below. That's, by the way, just applicable to new users, and thanks to World of Warships for sponsoring. And of course, thank you for watching.